You can't see it, but you know it's there. Well, you don't usually hear that in science, and definitely not in astronomy, which is the oldest of the sciences. For thousands of years, curious folks have been looking to the skies, trying to figure out what's up there, and the rule was, if you can't see it with your eyes or with a telescope, it just wasn't for real. Well, that's no longer true. Researchers Constantine Batigan and Mike Brown from Caltech believe they've found evidence of a massive planet in our solar system. Now, researchers haven't exactly laid eyes on Planet Nine. Batigan and Brown discovered it using computer simulations and mathematical models. Some of the most startling recent discoveries in astronomy have been of objects or of stuff that we can't see directly with our telescopes. And these discoveries aren't incidental. One example is a planet, 10 times more massive than Earth, far, far beyond Pluto. But how about learning that almost half of the universe is made up of something called dark matter? There's more of it than the stuff that makes up everything else you can see, and we still don't know what it is. But like this new planet, we're pretty sure it exists. I'm Molly Bentley. And I'm Seth Shostak. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, well, what you can't see may blow your mind. But more than that, some, such as the subatomic particles called neutrinos, may hold the key to the evolution of our universe, while... Others, such as dark matter, could shape our future and maybe even threaten your existence. A new theory asks whether dark matter had a hand in sending killer asteroids this way, such as the one that did in the dinosaurs. Dramatic stuff, and it's all 100% invisible. Imagine this. I say to you, there aren't nine planets in our solar system, but ten. Or there are nine planets, not eight, depending on how you cast your Pluto vote. Well, in other words, your carefully crafted seventh grade paper mache model of the solar system needs one more styrofoam ball. Make it several times the size of Earth and stick it on a wire beyond Pluto. Way beyond Pluto. Can you see that? Well, if so, you're doing better than the astronomers. That new planet has never been seen directly. And yet... There's now evidence that Planet X, sometimes called Planet Nine, exists. I'm Mike Brown, and I'm an astronomer at Caltech. Well, you say you're an astronomer, but where's the proof? And is your name even Mike Brown? Well, you could call that the Planet X treatment. Because for a long time, when claims were made about a Planet X, scientists were skeptical. The idea that there was a tenth planet somewhere beyond Pluto strained credulity. There was no observational evidence for it. People would occasionally come forward claiming they had proof and that this time it was definitive, but it never panned out. So it came to be that if you just said Planet X to astronomers, you'd get bemused looks. So when astronomer Mike Brown announced that he and his colleague, Constantine Batygin, had evidence of an additional purported planet that he called Planet Nine, well, there was a collective cry of, here we go again. But times have changed. Consider, we've discovered thousands of new planets, but only a handful of these have been seen directly. The rest are inferred. It's kind of like finding the carcass of a moose and inferring that there must be wolves in the neighborhood. <laughs> well, I've never heard that analogy. Okay, while the evidence for this planetary addition to our solar system is indirect, Dr. Brown says it's also compelling. Mike, uh, describe what you think you found here. Well, we think that we have seen the evidence on the very outskirts of our solar system for a planet well beyond the planets that we thought were there, a ninth planet that's about 10 times further out than Neptune is. That's quite far out. I mean, you know, nonetheless, this is, this is not a small planet, right? No, we actually, we think it's about 10 times the mass of the Earth, which means it's about two-thirds the mass of Neptune. And we, we think it's more likely a, a miniature Neptune sort of planet than anything else. Well, all right, if I were to translate that into diameter, you know, what would that make it, a couple of times the diameter of the Earth? Yeah, it's somewhere between about three and four times the diameter of the Earth. Well, that's pretty big. How yeah. did it, well, I, I don't want to impugn, you know, the astronomical profession. Far be it for me to do that, but, you know, how did, how did we miss this for so long? So at 10 times the distance of Neptune, and this is actually just the closest approach, it, it's on a very elongated orbit, so it goes from something like 10 times the distance of Neptune out to maybe 30 or 40 times the distance of Neptune. And at those extreme distances, it's really quite faint. So without knowing where to go looking, 
uh, we're unlikely to just stumble across it. Okay, well, let's uh, make sure that that's clear. We haven't actually seen this world yet. Yeah, I think that's actually the, the key point for everyone to realize. This is something that we think we have seen in the behavior of other objects, but we haven't seen the actual object itself yet. All right, well, tell us about this behavior of other objects. It's, uh, it's like trying to, to guess the personality of somebody you haven't met yet on the basis of uh, uh, what their friends say about them. It, it, it's sort of like that. You know, it's, it's actually a lot like the way that we find planets around other stars. We often don't see them, but we see their indirect effects of their gravity or something else. And this is the same sort of case. What we see is that at the very outer edge of the solar system, the very most distant objects in the Kuiper Belt, this region where Pluto and Eris and other objects are, the very most distant one of those are all pulled off in one specific direction. And, and they shouldn't be. They should be randomly distributed around the sky. And as, as soon as we realized they were pulled off in that one direction, uh, that was our first clue that something is going on out there that we need to explain. Well, when you say several, I mean, what what is several? I mean, if there are two or three of these uh, Kuiper Belt objects, these sort of cousins of Pluto, I guess, uh, that were kind of lined up, it would be like me getting a run of, I don't know, red on the roulette in Las Vegas. You know, I wouldn't say that there was something terribly wrong about that. Yeah, so you're exactly right. So the alignment is that there are six of them, which still, when you first hear that, doesn't sound like a very big number. There's six of them that are lined up, but those six are also tilted by a certain amount compared to the, the plane of the solar system. And they're also, they're sort of tilted to the right and downward, if you're looking at it in the right direction. And they're all tilted in the same way. They're all elongated out in the same way. And you can make a rough calculation of what the probability of that happening just due to chances. And you get that the chance is something like 0.07%. So it seems really unlikely that it's just due to chance. All right, that's better than a thousand to one. Yeah, it's not so bad. Yeah, yeah, I wish I had, I wish I had those odds in the lottery. Okay, right. <laughs> well, all right, so you've noticed this behavior for a while now. I mean, this isn't something you found last week. No, this is about two years that we've been working on this. So two years ago, I first started looking at this and I walked down the hallway to my to my colleague, Constantine Batigan, who's a professor in planetary science here. And I said, look, there's, there's something happening in the outer solar system. Let's figure it out. And the first thing we try to do is make sure that we could rule out the crazy idea that there was another planet out there because everybody knows there's not another planet out there. <laughs> and he said? I, we, we tried for about six months to rule out the planet and uh, we kept on not being able to rule out the planet and then we kept on realizing that the planet works better and better and then finally we realized that the planet not only works really well but it actually makes predictions that turn out to be true about other objects in the solar system. And that's the moment that we went from thinking this was kind of a fun off the wall project to realizing that, holy cow, I, th I think there really is a planet out there. Well, did you and Constantine, you know, jump in the car and run up to uh, uh, an observatory and start looking for this thing? Um, actually, literally, yes. We went off to Hawaii. We jumped on an airplane first, but we went to Hawaii. We got in the car. We went up to the Subaru telescope on the summit of Mauna Kea and started the search. Uh, obviously you didn't find it, but but is that a question of it being just too faint or is it just not knowing exactly where to look? Yeah, that's the problem. It's, it's that we know the path of the planet through the sky because we know the orbit and we know the tilt of it, but we don't know where along the path that it is. So we still have a good bit of sky to search, but we don't have the whole sky. So it's, it's like we have a narrow strip of lawn that we still have to take the lawnmower all the way over, but uh, we'll get there eventually. And eventually is, what's your, what's your guess? Are we talking months, years, what? I think that we will find it within five years. All right, bet a, bet a beer on that. I, absolutely, I would. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you know, your Twitter handle, I may be mistaken about this, but I think your Twitter handle is Pluto Killer. Yeah, I think you might be right. <laughs> okay, Pluto Killer. Because you're the guy really fundamentally responsible for the fact that Pluto got demoted as a planet. And here you are coming in with the ninth planet. Is this some sort of contrition? Uh, I, you know, I actually think that this is, it's kind of interesting. If you had gone to sleep for 11 years and, and woken up and you would see that there's still nine planets and you would think nothing has happened in the, in the meantime. Um, yeah. But really what this does is we have taken something that never should have been a planet in the first place and uh, replaced it with something that is obviously a planet. So we really have done a great service to explaining what planets are in our own solar system. So I'm, I'm very happy about this. I read that you were quoted, Mike, as saying that Killing Pluto was fun, but this is <laughs> this is head and shoulders above anything else. Why'd you say that? Oh, it's because this, you know, it, 
having Pluto classified correctly, I think was an important task to get done and, and finding all these other objects outside Pluto. It's been, it's been fantastic over the past 10, 15 years. But really, when I started this research in the outer solar system 20 years ago, I started it because I thought that there was probably another planet out there. The reason that Pluto went along the wayside back then is because we were looking and looking and looking. Pluto was just collateral damage. This was the goal all along. And I, I thought it was gone. After we finally got rid of Pluto and didn't find any more big objects, I was pretty convinced there was nothing else out there. So now I'm just as excited as can be that 20 years later, we're back on the hunt for this ninth planet. <laughs> Mike Brown, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Uh, it's always my pleasure, Seth. Mike Brown is an astronomer at the California Institute of Technology. Well, interesting finding, huh? Yeah, very much so. Um, in just a second, though, there's something I need to do. Hi, Shri. It's Seth Shostak from Big Picture Science. How are things down there at Caltech? Uh, pretty good. It's been a while since I heard from you, Seth. Yeah. Uh, things are great here. Really? Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm always uh, keen to know what's going on in the astronomy department there. Listen, do you have a second? I want to double-check something. Go ahead. All right. We just interviewed a man claiming to be a Caltech astronomer named Mike Brown. Now, he laid out the evidence for the existence of a Planet Nine, which I must say was pretty compelling. But, you know, with all the speculation arising from this discovery, we feel we need to verify all aspects of it. So can I ask you, I mean, you know, to your knowledge, does a Mike Brown really work there at Caltech? Indeed, he is, in fact, a colleague of mine. He is a professor in the Division of Geology and Planetary Science. Okay, so he is indeed an astronomer. He's not a biologist just trying to horn in on this planet discovery. No, not at all. He is, in fact, a card-carrying member of planetary astronomy. <laughs> I, I didn't know you could get a card for that. Well, okay, uh, listen, I kind of figured that because he did seem pretty knowledgeable about astronomy, but it's always best to double-check. Yeah, it's good to check. Thanks very much, Shri. Bye-bye. Yeah, that's a relief. Coming up, how does the evidence for the existence of this new planet stack up? And why are theories lingering about it being the notorious rogue planet Nibiru, supposedly on a collision course with Earth? Plus, ghostly particles that can elude our most sophisticated detection devices may be responsible for the existence of stars, galaxies, and you. I didn't see that coming. But then again, it's 100% invisible on Big Picture Science. Well, we heard the evidence about Planet Nine and we checked out the bona fides of astronomer Mike Brown. It's good to know what's what so we can feel confident about this Planet Nine story. I'm Mike Lemonick. I'm an editor at Scientific American Magazine. I am convinced that Planet Nine is real. Although, since I'm not an expert, you shouldn't listen to me. Okay, well, we might want to listen to him because Mike Lemonick reported on this research and the long history of the search for Planet Nine for Scientific American. He can put the purported find in perspective, including how the discovery of Neptune in 1846 played a role. His article, The Search for Planet X, is the cover story of the February issue. But Mike Lemonick is right. He is not the one to persuade us that the planet exists. That is the role of evidence. Well, let's review that evidence. Astronomers and planetary scientists say that they've noticed that there were objects far out in the Kuiper belt whose orbits seem oddly synchronized. And it was thought that the gravity of a large planet far beyond Neptune and Pluto was affecting these smaller objects. What's more, they all have orbits that have an unusual tilt, and they're all tilted by roughly the same amount. Well, that's just too much to be coincidence. Okay, Mike, you titled your article The Search for Planet X. Is that the same thing as this mysterious Planet 9? I mean, Planet X kind of means Planet 10. 
Yeah, I know that. I can see there was some confusion on Facebook. People were complaining about that. Planet X, as you probably know, is the generic term for a mysterious, undiscovered planet whose gravity is showing up in the behavior of other objects. So in in uh, the early part of the 20th century, Percival Lowell set out to find Planet X. We knew about Uranus and Neptune, but Neptune seemed to be acting funny. And so he said there must be a large planet out there, Planet X, for X being unknown, and let's go search for it. And they ended up finding Pluto, which in fact could not have uh, affected Neptune's orbit. And in the end, they realized the funny things about Neptune's orbit were a mistake. Neptune was behaving fine. Anyway, Planet X is a generic term for a large undiscovered planet. If it's the ninth planet, still okay with you. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. <laughs> well, okay, we spoke with astronomer Mike Brown. He gave us the skinny on this planet. Do you have any opinions about the evidence? I mean, are you convinced? Is it really there? Or astronomers jumping to conclusions? Well, I mean, I am a science journalist. I'm not a scientist. And Mike Brown is pretty legitimate, and so are several of the other people I spoke with. And they all seem to think that this evidence boosts the case for a large planet to a pretty high degree. They're not claiming they've detected it. They're just saying that the evidence is pretty strong and they can't come up with another explanation. And I, because of who's saying this, I, I take it seriously. All right. Well, I mean, they've made a prediction then. I mean, this, this is great. This is like, uh, I don't know, it's like Babe Ruth pointing to the, uh, the bleachers and saying, I'm going to hit the ball there. They've made a prediction. Why isn't anybody looking for this planet? Well, they, people are looking for it. So uh, Mike Brown has been looking for it for at least a year, and he's been doing it quietly because he wants to be the one to discover it. You know, once he tells everybody about it, they're all going to go out and look. But he, he told me that he was impatient. It would probably take him five or six years, and he doesn't want to wait that long. So he's invited others to join the party, and it's very clear that they are going to do so. And in fact, this planet, if it exists and it's in the place that they think it is, might actually have shown up in existing surveys. There might be evidence for it already and nobody noticed because they didn't know what they were looking for. So in fact, the discovery of this Planet X or Planet 9, as Mike Brown and his colleagues call it, I mean, that, that discovery might have already been made. It might be sitting on somebody's hard drive, right? Exactly, exactly. You know that there's some evidence that Galileo in 1610 or something saw Neptune, or maybe it was Uranus, and noted it but thought it was a star, and nobody thought about it again for 150 years. Uh, what about the credibility? Because, you know, you said astronomers can't come up with another explanation for the odd orbits of these outer solar system bodies, these Kuiper Belt objects. What a terrible name to have for yourself. But, you know, other than that, there's a big planet out there. But on the other hand, I'm thinking now of KIC 846-2852, this uh, so-called Tabby star which, you know, dims occasionally, and, and people say, well, maybe it's aliens that have built some giant astro-engineering object around this thing. And, and you could say, well, they can't come up with another explanation. I mean, you know, how credible is this big planet explanation? Well, so I would say that big planets, we know they exist. Alien megastructures, we don't know they exist. So already you're talking about a more plausible explanation. You know, if they were saying aliens are making these Kuiper Belt objects behave badly, I would be more dubious. Uh, but they're not claiming they've discovered this thing. They're just saying, we think it's the best explanation we can come up with. And unlike those alien megastructures, this is something that, as you say, it's a prediction and it should be, if it's where they say it is, and if it's as big and, and bright or dim as they say it is, we should really know within a couple of years. Why, why do you think this story excites the public? Uh, it, it seems to. It was the biggest story uh, in the local media here not too long ago. Well, I think the fact that the solar system, which we think we understand very well, is maybe something we don't understand. The thing that the idea that there's a, a huge planet, you know, when Pluto was demoted, people were upset, but Pluto is relatively small. It's, it's this, we know it's there and what you call it, whether it's a planet or not, you know, is not, not that important scientifically, or it seems to me, but something 10 times the mass of Earth in our own solar system is just, just kind of mind blowing. Well, what about some people who are going to say, you know, I know the name of this planet, and it's not Planet Nine or Planet X. It's Nibiru. And I've seen exactly that. I've seen exactly that. Well, tell uh, me what Nibiru is so that... Uh, well, I, I don't follow these things quite so closely, but it's evidently, it's supposed to be this 
undiscovered planet in our solar system, except the Sumerians knew all about it somehow, <laughs> and uh, you know, with their telescopes. And I think th I, there might be aliens living on it, or I don't know. And and I think there's someday it's going to come in and crash into Earth. It's it's one of these conspiracy things that pops up any time you start talking about planetary science. Well, in fact, uh, it was invoked as perhaps the cause for the end of the world that apparently happened three or four years ago, but didn't happen. Uh, it was going to sail through the inner solar system and, you know, tsunamis, earthquakes, uh, general uh, havoc and destruction. Uh, but, of course, this planet uh, that we're talking about today, if it's there, it's at least, you know, 200 astronomical units away. In other words, it's so far away, it's, it's not going to ruin your lifestyle, is it? Uh, no, certainly not mine. I, I understand astrologers are very interested because it, this may explain why their predictions have gone wrong so often. They weren't taking into account the effects of Planet Nine. <laughs> well, that's, that's certainly convenient. So, Mike, if, if this planet is really there, it would be a super-Earth. And, of course, a super-Earth is just a planet that's bigger than our planet, but not more than 10 times the mass of Earth, okay? So maybe it's twice the diameter or something like that. But we don't have any super-Earths in our solar system, although we find them all over the place. So would that make our solar system a lot more like other solar systems? Would we be less different than the other kids in the class? Yeah, this is, I mean, people who look for exoplanets were surprised to find so many of these super-Earths midway, or not midway, but in between the size of Earth and Neptune. And um, they're all over the place, but they're not here and so the question is, why not? And nobody has a really good answer, but but one answer may be that they were here and some of them, most of them were ejected from the solar system during the early days by gravitational interactions with maybe Jupiter and Saturn, uh, but that this one didn't make it all the way out. And so we may have a super Earth to call our own. Yeah, well, I you know, I don't know what we would do with it, but on the other hand, knowing that our solar system may not be all that special, would, I would think, encourage people who are hoping to find life elsewhere? Uh, probably so. Probably so. People have been complaining also on Facebook. I go on Facebook a lot. Um, that that they're calling this a super Earth, and that's ridiculous because it, it's not friendly to life. They don't understand what the definition of super Earth is. And the conventional wisdom says, well, you know, this couldn't host life. It'd be so cold and so far out. There'd be no light. But our understanding of where life could exist, or even where liquid water, which is necessary, we think, for life, could exist, has changed so much in the past decade or two that I wouldn't rule anything out. Well, finally, Mike, I mean, many people are probably wondering, okay, another far-off world, you know, but I've got real problems right here on Earth. What, what do you say to these people? Well, actually, I, I, I finally came up with something. I was on a radio interview, and I was talking about cosmology, which is even more you know, out there and, and unrelated to our daily lives. And we uh, science journalists have this standard answer. I think scientists do too. It's like, well, it tells us about our origins and where we came from and the grand... And I, I was stopped in the middle of this explanation. I said, you know what? If it's just not the coolest thing you've heard all week, I can't help you. <laughs> Mike Lemonick, thanks so very much for talking with us. My pleasure. Michael Lemonick is a science writer and editor at Scientific American Magazine. His cover story, The Search for Planet X, is in the February 2016 issue. One interesting aspect here, of course, is the fact that this would be what's called a super-Earth, right? Uh, a planet bigger than the Earth, smaller than Neptune. And those are the kinds of planets that uh, the planet hunters, who are looking for planets around other stars, are finding most often. These are very, very common in the universe, and we were kind of deprived not having one. Well, maybe we're not deprived. So you're saying that maybe our solar system isn't all that special if we have a super-Earth. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that might be a good thing, even though it sounds like a bad thing, because, you know, if we're more normal, then maybe it isn't just the planetary arrangements that are more normal. Maybe it's the fact that we've got biology in this solar system that's more normal, too. So that's kind of encouraging. Is more normal the new normal? <laughs> I don't know. All I can say is that my attempts to be normal have never worked out.
Well, ghostly particles called neutrinos have been called the tiniest quantity of reality ever imagined by a human being. And a hundred trillion of these things are passing through you every second. You can't see them, you can't feel them, so why not dismiss them? Well, because the majority of them are really old, dating back to shortly after the Big Bang, and they didn't just witness the birth of our universe, they had a role in shaping its evolution. You can thank your local neutrino for you being you. Neutrinos are elementary particles, just as protons, neutrons, and electrons are. And neutrinos, a name given to these things by the Italian-American physicist Enrico Fermi in the 1930s, are second only to photons in abundance in the universe. But unlike photons, we now think that neutrinos have mass and that their collective gravity could have a role in shaping the universe. But no one knew for sure. Mass or no mass? Sounds kind of like a Sunday morning church dilemma. But then, experiments at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, which is located in an underground mine outside of Sudbury, Ontario, discovered through some high-energy collision work that neutrinos could change their stripes and turn into something we call muon and tau neutrinos. They had flipped their identity, and that was evidence that they had mass. The experiment was led by astrophysicist Arthur McDonald, and his discovery that neutrinos have mass took him to Stockholm in December 2015, where he was the co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics. Art, how many neutrinos are passing through me right now, if you had to take a guess? Ah, well, through you. Let me talk about per square centimeter, which is about the size of your thumbnail, and that's uh, about 5 billion per second from the sun. And we can't feel them as they pass through us. Oh, that's right. Neutrinos really only stop if they hit the nucleus of an atom or the electron surrounding the nucleus head-on. And so for them, matter is open space. So perhaps once in your lifetime, a neutrino will hit an atom and change it into another chemical form, but you won't even notice it. And yet they're significant. They're important. Why are neutrinos important? They're important from a basic physics point of view because along with electrons and quarks, they are the basic particles that we don't know how to subdivide any further. They come in three flavors, electron, mu, and tau. And uh, those types of flavors of neutrinos, if they change as they travel, that can only happen if neutrinos have a finite mass. And that's what we observed in our experiments. And the mass of neutrinos is a very important property because it influences how stars and galaxies are formed following the Big Bang. The question of how neutrinos change from one type to another is a, of influence in supernova, collapsing stars. And in supernova, all of the elements heavier than iron are produced. So our very makeup is influenced by the properties of neutrinos. You said that the neutrinos that are passing through me right now probably came from the sun. Is that the only source of neutrinos? It isn't the only source, but it's uh, essentially the most prolific source. The fusion reactions that power the sun produce enormous numbers of uh, neutrinos in the process. This is nuclear fusion, where nuclei like deuterium are combining to produce energy. Basically, neutrinos are produced every time there is a type of radioactive decay called beta decay. And so, in fact, there are neutrinos coming from the Earth, predominantly from the uranium and thorium content in the Earth. There are neutrinos produced in the atmosphere by cosmic rays. There are neutrinos produced in all of the stars. Neutrinos were also produced in the Big Bang, weren't they? They were. And in fact, other than uh, photons, they are the largest number of particles that are produced back then. Basically, when they're produced, uh, they just take off out of there and don't get <laughs> stopped by anything. What does it mean to say they were involved in the evolution of the universe and the formation of the structure of stars and galaxies? I mean, are neutrinos the stuff that stars and galaxies are made out of, or did they sort of nudge matter to form the stars and galaxies? How did they play a role? The latter rather than the former. Stars and galaxies obviously are made from the type of things that we are made of. The sequence after the Big Bang is that there's this enormous creation of matter from energy, we, we think. And originally you produce the, the very uh, fundamental particles, electrons, quarks, and neutrinos. Gradually, as the expansion happens following the Big Bang, things cool off, and eventually they come to the point where 
quarks can come together to form protons, and then as it cools further, protons uh, can come together with neutrons to form nuclei, and then electrons surround them and form uh, neutral atoms, and then you start getting structure formation. It's the effect of neutrinos and interacting with this matter is what uh, influences how the structure forms. Is it safe to say that without neutrinos, you and I would not be here having a conversation? I know many other things had to come together for you and I to be talking, but without neutrinos, we wouldn't exist. No, that's right. (laughs) That's correct. Well, for a long time, it was thought that neutrinos did not have mass, and now we know that they do have mass. But being massless would provide one explanation why they are so hard to detect. And yet we know that they have mass. So why are they hard to detect? Well, they're hard to detect for the reason that I mentioned earlier, that they only stop when they hit a nucleus of an atom or an electron uh, essentially head on. In other words, within a a very small fraction of the radius of that particle. So the uh, way in which we detect them is by using the process of having them interact with a nucleus. For example, in our case, we picked deuterium, which is hydrogen with an extra neutron in it. Uh, We were able to measure two reactions, one of them sensitive to specifically the type of neutrinos produced in the core of the sun, electron neutrinos, and another one sensitive equally to all neutrino types. By comparing those two reactions, we could tell whether the neutrinos reaching the Earth are only electron neutrinos or whether there are more neutrinos of other types, and in fact, that's exactly what we observed. So the others had turned into tau or muon neutrinos? That's right. Okay, that I understand, that you were able to determine that neutrinos can turn into variations of neutrinos, tau, muon, or electrons. But then how does that suggest that these neutrinos have mass? Is the idea that if they did not have mass, they wouldn't be able to turn into anything? That's right. Uh, If they're traveling at the speed of light, uh, then that isn't possible. And so uh, the process of oscillation from one type to another in itself is an indication that they are not traveling at the speed of light and therefore are not massless. You detected the neutrinos in a facility that is two kilometers underground. And why do you need to have a detector so deep in the Earth? Well, the reason is that we want to observe very faint bursts of light. We observed a neutrino from the sun interacting in this 1,000 tons of heavy water in a detector uh, the size of a 10-story building once an hour. So we really had to uh, remove all other sources of radioactivity, and one of the principal sources of such radioactivity that could produce light in our detector is cosmic rays that bombard the uh, surface of the Earth. In fact, the process of producing the northern lights would be the process that ends up making our detector glow. So we wanted to avoid that. By going down two kilometers, we have more than a million times fewer cosmic rays hitting our detector at that depth. You have said that neutrinos are important because they were involved in the evolution of the universe. And that is something that you understood before you detected that neutrinos have mass. Now that we understand that neutrinos do have mass, how does it change our understanding about how they helped the universe evolve? And how have those questions changed? Observing that neutrinos have a finite mass means it's really the first firm piece of data that goes beyond the standard model for elementary particles, for which we had such a tremendous success with the observation of the Higgs particle recently. That model postulated that neutrinos have zero mass. We now know that that's not true, and it means that you have to put in extensions to that model. When you start thinking of extensions to the model, you start thinking of physics that goes beyond the standard model, physics that goes beyond the standard model can have implications in general in how the universe has evolved. One example in which neutrinos may well be participating is the case that uh, we think that since we started with energy converting into mass in the original Big Bang, we think that there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter produced at that time. But somehow we live in a universe that's almost exclusively matter with the exception of some radioactivity producing positrons and so on that are antimatter particles. And so where did all that antimatter go to? Uh, It must have decayed away in the early universe. There must be an asymmetry between matter and antimatter uh, in the early universe. And 
for us to understand the theory of how that happened, further experiments on the properties of neutrinos are being carried out uh, these days, including, for example, a long baseline experiment from Fermilab to the uh, Homestake mine in South Dakota. Now, when you were doing this research on neutrinos, and you were doing, you are still doing, did you have any hint that you might be doing Nobel Prize winning physics? <laughs> um, our scientists were attempting to do measurements that would be of significance in terms of influencing our knowledge of the, uh, the laws of physics at a very fundamental nature. The fact that the Nobel Prize has been awarded for this research is something that all of us in the collaboration are very, very pleased about. But the objective in the first place was simply to do science that would be significant. Art McDonald, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Arthur McDonald is an astrophysicist at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and the director of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. He's a recipient of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics for his work demonstrating that neutrinos have mass. Okay, thanks to experiments with ghostly neutrinos, we may learn how our universe came to be. But that's not the only invisible force shaping our destiny. Nearly a half of the universe is made up of something called dark matter. We can't see it directly, but we know it's there. And now a speculative scenario asks whether this invisible matter contributed to a very visible change in our planet's biological diversity 66 million years ago, and whether it could do so again. Dark Matter, The Dinosaurs, and physicist Lisa Randall, next. It's 100% invisible on Big Picture Science. Dark matter is weird. It's invisible, but it makes up nearly half the stuff in the universe that you can see. Your house, maple trees, the earth itself, and yet we don't know what it is. So how do we know it's there? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. But first, a dramatic development in matters of dark matter. A development so dark, you could call it noir. <laughs> I'm telling you, doll, this crime scene wasn't pretty. They never are. Bodies everywhere. Oh, I can't bear it. The Triceratops, the T-Rex, and dozens of dinosaur species gone. Plus any critter bigger than a glove box. Who or what done it? We thought we knew. A rock from space. It came barreling down faster than a hitman hops in a boiler to skip town. And suddenly, everything's past tense. We had the case sewn up. But now it ain't looking so straightforward. A second suspect has come to light, and we're in the dark. The rock had an accomplice. That's what we're thinking. It had help from an invisible hand, a silent partner, a mysterious cohort, an enigmatic- I get the idea. And tracking them down in this dark city ain't gonna be easy. Innocent until proven guilty, right? But could dark matter have had a hand in doing away with the dinosaurs? It's a speculative idea, something that Harvard physicist Lisa Randall emphasizes, that the pull of dark matter may have put that asteroid on a collision path with Earth. But what's more, if so, it may be responsible for a pattern in asteroid and comet impacts in our past and also in our future. Her book, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, examines the connection between the two, but also the overall interconnectedness of the universe. But first, we meet the suspect in question, dark matter. Just what is it? So dark matter is just matter that doesn't interact with light. It's matter in the sense that it interacts with gravity like matter. It clumps together. It's in our galaxy. But as far as we know, it doesn't interact with light, which is why we literally don't see it. However, we do observe its gravitational influences. 
Okay, but, you know, my understanding is that dark matter, I mean, it's a major constituent of the cosmos. Maybe, I don't know, one-third of all the mass that's out there is maybe in dark matter. But that, if you ask, what about the dark... Actually, most of the mass that's out there is in dark matter. All right, well, I, I've underestimated its influence there. But my understanding was that if you talked about dark matter in the Milky Way, it was it was just that the, the Milky Way was kind of bathed in, in dark matter. There was this kind of this smooth envelope, this halo of dark matter. Nobody ever said anything about a... You know, flat disk anywhere. That's right. You know, we're we're so parochial. We think that our matter is so interesting, but dark matter is really boring, and it's just one thing. We said maybe dark matter is a little bit more interesting too, and say a fraction of it might also have collapsed into a disk, just like the ordinary matter of the Milky Way. That's what we're focusing on. Okay, but before we talk about how this dark matter may have, you know, wiped out the dinosaurs, I mean, there's a connection there. Remind us first what we do know about the dinosaurs' demise. Well, what we do know is that very close to the time of the dinosaurs' demise, and by very close, I mean within 20,000 years, which is very close from the point of view of something that happened 66 million years ago. By observations, we know that a big object, like 10 to 15 kilometers big, hit the Earth traveling at speeds of maybe 30, 40 kilometers per second. So something collided into the Earth, releasing an enormous amount of energy, which caused enormous devastation, any kind of devastation you can think of, pretty much. And that caused a mass extinction, including the extinction of the dinosaurs. All right, so they were wiped out by a rock, and I, I do believe that a lot of people, of course, have heard that story. But you say, okay, dark matter may have had a role in that, I mean, it wasn't dark matter that slammed into the Yucatan 66 million years ago. How does dark matter figure in this scenario? What we suggest is that the disk of dark matter, as the solar system goes around our galaxy, which it does about every 240 million years, it bobs up and down slightly like horses on a carousel. So what we're saying is that as it goes through the Milky Way planet and hence the dark matter disk as well, that the gravitational force of this very dense disk of dark matter might be enough to perturb very weakly bound objects at the edge of the solar system in what's called the Oort cloud. And maybe that little kick dislodged some of the stuff that then killed the dinosaurs. So it would be this dark matter disk that kind of let the dogs out. I mean, these... these Right. <laughs> so basically, the stuff in the Oort cloud is pretty weakly bound. It's so far away from the sun that the gravitational force of the sun is fairly weak. So basically, anything that gives it a kick has the potential to knock it out. You know, it's just knocking it out of its orbit, so it might leave the solar system, or it might come hurtling down to the inner solar system, where it has the potential to strike the Earth. So what we're suggesting is that this happens on a periodic basis. Basically, every time the solar system passes through the dark matter disk, there'll be this extra kick. You know, other stuff, as you know, hits all the time. There's random hits. Um, you know, tiny stuff is just there in the atmosphere always. But the bigger something is, the less likely it is to happen. So we're suggesting that the big stuff is getting kicked out on this periodic basis of around 30 million years. And that matches fairly well the crater record of large craters. You mentioned that this would happen periodically. And, you know, <laughs> the solar system going up and down through the plane of the galaxy like a, well, a carousel horse, yes. And I think you said every 30, 35 million years. Well, it's been twice that length of time since the dinosaurs bought it. I mean, aren't we due for another hit? Well, actually, we passed through a couple of million years ago. And, you know, there were hits. It's just that they weren't so devastating that, that they caused a mass extinction. Not everything is going to cause a mass extinction, obviously. Something has to be sufficiently big to do that. You know, some of the stuff that's going to hit, it's just going to hit in the ocean. Most of the Earth is covered by ocean. A lot of the stuff we don't see. And we're certainly not predicting extinctions happen this often. We're just predicting that stuff is more likely to hit the Earth at those particular times. Well, it sounds like you're not building a bomb shelter anyhow. Th this idea is a very clever one because it suggests an entirely different mechanism, if you will, a, a different reason for why this big rocket hit us 66 million years ago. What sort of evidence do you think would be required to support your idea? Well, you know, we didn't start off trying to explain how the dinosaurs went extinct. The thing that interests us is, of course, the nature of dark matter. And so the way we know about dark matter is because precisely of its air gravitational influence. So what we're saying is that by measuring better the gravitational influence of dark matter, we can hope to learn more about its nature. And in particular, if we measure the motion of a lot of stars, even in our Milky Way, we can then map out the gravitational potential of the galaxy. 
And one of the really remarkable things when we were doing our work, as you know, I usually do particle physics, and the scale of experiments is pretty big. But when we were doing this research, Gaia, the satellite that's going to measure a billion stars in the Milky Way, the position and velocities, was about to launch. And that is exactly the measurement we would like to see whether or not this disk exists in our Milky Way. And if it does, what are its properties? Lisa, your book takes a wider look at the threats facing our planet, and an impending comet or asteroid is just maybe the least of them. I mean, growing population, the hasty use up of our planet's resources at a rapid pace, these are all kind of like slow-moving comets, you write. Tell me, tell me more about that. Well, you know, I think it's very easy to get caught up in these sort of cataclysmic events at some level. But there's stuff that's happening all around us. And one of the reasons I wrote the book, I'm, it's not a book specifically about those disasters, but I think when we think about what we are doing to the planet today, it's really important to have a good sense of where we came from, um, to put it all in perspective, to think about the cosmological history over billions of years, the history of life over millions of years, the history of complex life over thousands of years, and really put that story together just because it's interesting to put it together in its own right, but also it gives us some perspective when we think about how rapidly we're changing the face of the planet today. In my lifetime, the population has doubled. That's kind of an enormous rate of growth. So we really want to think about what this is doing to the planet. The other joys of writing this book was connecting the sort of more abstract-seeming work I do um, you know, about elementary particles to things that are very concrete that surround us you know, on Earth today and to think about those processes and just the complex relationships that sustain them. When people talk about our future as a species, and quite a few people seem to be apocalyptic about that, you know, they'll usually point to climate change or whatever is their favorite, you know, bad thing and say that we're on our way out, but maybe the salvation would be to colonize other planets, uh, you know, set up a housekeeping either in orbit or on the moon, Mars, whatever. You don't seem to think that's a good idea. In fact, you seem to be one of the few scientists who study space who would not want to go to Mars. Why, why is that? Well, first of all, I've been to unpleasant places, and I don't really like it. Think about it. The Earth is pretty hospitable for humans, in fact. That's probably why we developed the way we did. I think one of the confusions people always have is, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a question of survival. It's a question of survival of us as we are today. I mean, I kind of like our lifestyle at some level. Um, I'm not sure I'd really want to live in a place that was so carefully constructed that it was really not hospitable for me when I first got there. But I also think that, you know, if someone told you, don't worry, um, so we're going to destroy your house, but we'll give you a house in the middle of the outback in Australia, you know, you probably wouldn't be that happy about it. You'd say, I kind of like where I live now. It's not that it's bad to explore those places. It's a good place to put a telescope. But it's also a good idea to, you know, protect what we actually know works pretty well. Lisa Randall, thanks so very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Lisa Randall is a physicist at Harvard University, and she is the author of Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, The Astounding Interconnectedness of the Universe. Well, what we've heard in this show is that just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And sometimes what you can't see has dramatic implications, at least when it comes to the universe. Yeah, well, you know, that 10th planet that might make our solar system a, a little bit more normal or the neutrinos, the fact that they could have affected the way the universe is built. I mean, these the tiny little invisible particles and then dark matter, dark matter that, you know, might have wiped out the dinosaurs. They didn't know anything about dark matter. They couldn't see it. And yet this invisible thing may have been the reason for their demise. And may play a role in future asteroid or comet collisions with Earth. Indeed. And that might be a good incentive to continue our work in learning how to deflect asteroids. And in figuring out just what dark matter is. What comes out of this for me is that, you know, sometimes answering the most fundamental, most interesting questions about our existence may come from studying those parts of the universe that we actually can't see yet. Well, thanks to the invisible forces behind the scene who helped produce this show, Gary Niederhoff, Barbara Vance, and our intern, Aaron Ross. Also, thanks to financial support from Rena Shulsky david and Sammy David, Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, where scientists study the origin and nature of life. 
And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to 100% Invisible. If you crave more Big Picture Science, you can find it in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener, but you prefer listening to over-the-air radio because you like the idea of your entertainment passing through all that dark matter, well, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. And if you listen by using iTunes, we invite you to leave a review about Big Picture Science on our iTunes page. And to reach us directly with your comments, well, be sure to throw in some faint praise, but email it all to bigpicturescience at seti.org. An unseen force, a cryptic cohort. You know, it's clear what you mean. A clandestine comrade, an incognito amigo. You just choose one. A latent agent, an unapparent partner, a concealed confederate.